Okay, well, we might make a start. And thank you again so much for joining us this evening. We're really pleased to have you with us. My name is Deborah Palmer, and I'm facilitating tonight's session on behalf of the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communications, and the Arts. So tonight's webinar is an opportunity for you to learn a bit more about the Western Sydney International um, Nancy Bird Walton Airport um, airspace design. And in particular, we're focusing tonight on the draft environmental impact statement, um, an opportunity to orientate you towards the draft environmental impact statement and what it contains, um, and to for us to present some areas and topics of interest um, to you. And also a, a really importantly to um, answer some questions questions that you might have in tonight's session. And in a few moments, I'll run through the agenda um, and highlight where we've got opportunity to take questions in tonight's session. But also too, really importantly tonight, we want to make sure that you have um, information to be able to then make an informed submission as part of the environmental impact assessment process as well. So thank you again for joining us um, for tonight's session. Just letting you know that we are recording tonight's session and the purpose of doing that recording is so that we can make the recording available on the um, department's website following tonight's session. So you can re-watch the session or if people weren't able to join us tonight, they'll be able to watch as well. Um, and for your privacy, what we've done is to turn off everybody's cameras except for the members of the team that are joining us here tonight as well. And I'll introduce you in just a few moments. If we go to the next slide, please. I'd like to acknowledge that tonight we're on many different Aboriginal lands and for me tonight we're meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but I would like to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands in which we meet, work and live. We recognise and respect um, Aboriginal people's continuing connection to the lands, waters and the communities that we will live and work in. Thank you. So in terms of what we're going to cover in tonight's um, sessions, uh, we're just going to provide you with a bit of background just about the Western Sydney International um, Nancy Bird Walton Airport. Um, and then importantly, orientate you to the draft EAS and the public exhibition period. We'll then talk through um, very briefly the um, Western Sydney International flight paths and the changes to other airports. Uh, we have done previously another webinar earlier in the year around the Western Sydney International Flight Pass themselves and a copy of that recording of that webinar is available on the website as well. So you can watch that for a bit more of a detailed understanding and run through of the, the flight paths out of Western Sydney International, but we will be touching on that in tonight's webinar. We'll then pause for some questions and answers um, and then we'll going to delve into some of the key topics in the draft environmental impact assessment. It's a really um, long and detailed document. It's over 4,000 pages. And what we're going to try and do is condense um, the, the key pieces of information in this session for you um, and orientate you towards the environmental impact assessment. So you can have a look at that in uh, more detail following tonight's session as well. We'll also be talking through the draft noise insulation and property acquisition policy, which has been released for comment. Um, during the exhibition period as well. We'll pause again for some questions and answers and then importantly um, run you through the community engagement opportunities um, the opportunities to meet the team face to face and also how you make a submission um, during the public exhibition period as well. We'll then have some more time for Q&A before we close out at 8.30 so we're planning to run for, for two hours this evening. Um, so thank you for your time um, and for joining us this evening as well. If we go to the next slide, thank you. So just in terms of how to ask questions in tonight's session, down the bottom of your screen, there is um, two speech bubbles um, with the Q&A logo on it. If you open up that um, uh, uh, icon there that will open up a pop-up box and you'll be able to ask questions using that Q&A function. We do have a lot of people online tonight um, so what I'll be trying to do is get through as many questions as we possibly can in tonight's session. So I might not read out your question exactly but I will try and summarise some of the key questions that we're hearing in tonight's session but I will make an attempt to try and get through as many questions as I can in the session. The other thing too for you aren't able to answer your question tonight, I do encourage you to come along to one of our um, community information and feedback sessions or community stalls, which we are hosting across Western Sydney, the Blue Mountains and Greater Sydney 
over the coming weeks um, and we'll run through a list of those locations um, at the end of the webinar tonight but you can also find those details up on our website which is wissyflightpaths.gov.au as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the team that is with me tonight. So David Jansen is the Assistant Secretary of the Western Sydney uh, Airport Regulation and Policy Branch within the department. David, nice to have you with us tonight. Um, also joining us is Anna Rin and John Wyatt from the department as well. Um, Damien Williams, who's the Principal Environmental Consultant at WSP, is joining us. And Damien will be talking about the Draft Environmental Impact Statement. It's nice to have you with us, Damien. Um, and also joining us tonight is Annette Dittmar, who's the Senior Advisor of Community Engagement with Air Services Australia. Um, it's great to have you with us tonight too. Thanks so much, Annette, for joining us and being part of the panel tonight as well. So I'd now like to hand over to David Jansen. Um, as I said, he's the Assistant Secretary um, in the Western Sydney Airport Regulatory and Policy Branch within the department. Um, thanks, David, for joining us tonight. And um, uh, over to you in terms of the airport itself. Thanks, Deb. Um, and thank you, everyone, for finding the time to join us this evening. We really appreciate your interest and participation uh, in this uh, project. So look, I've got a few slides to go through uh, this evening, but as Deb said, we'll pause at regular intervals so um, you can ask uh, questions to anyone in the team. Um, I'm thinking that if you're here on this call, you already know everything on this slide, so I won't uh, dwell on it. Um, as as uh, most, if not all of you would be aware, the airport is well underway. It's on track to open in 2026. It will have international domestic passenger uh, and freight uh, services. Uh, predominantly geared towards the, the commercial end of the market, but a very flexible piece of infrastructure, so it'll be able to accommodate all aircraft types. 24-hour um, curfew-free operations uh, and has been uh, designed and intended to operate that way from uh, the very beginning. Uh, what, it, what is being built is what we call stage one of the airport. So um, that's an initial passenger terminal, which you can see there in the photo, and single runway uh, operations. As time and demand uh, grows on, we expect um, the passenger terminal to grow in size, the passenger throughput to increase, and uh, one day uh, for there to be a second uh, parallel runway uh, at the airport site. Um, the Australian government is responsible for the flight paths for single runway operations uh, at the airport site, and so I'm from the Department of Infrastructure, um, and we work with a range of our Commonwealth uh, agencies, including Defence. Uh, Air Services, who's with us here tonight, uh, and CASA as well, to make sure that we have safe, robust, environmentally sensitive flight paths. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, as, as most, um, uh, if not all of you are aware, the draft environmental impact statement for Western Sydney's preliminary flight pass was released by the government on the 24th of October, 2023. It is open for your feedback until uh, 31 January 2024 uh, and that feedback can be provided through um, those channels we uh, list there. So online if you go to wsiflightpass.gov.au and follow the prompts or you might like to email us or, or some of you would, would like to use the postal system to get your views to us uh, as well. At this stage, we'll be looking at a final EIS draft mid next year, and we hope to finalise it in the second half uh, of next year. So what is in the draft EIS? Um, well, it's 4,322 pages um, of uh, various layers of material. It's, it's a very, very big um, document. Um, a, a large chunk of of that is in the technical papers. So unless you're really, really keen, um, the, the EIS proper, so part A, B, C, and D is probably where you get the most of your information. Um, and there's a summary of that uh, as well. So depending on, on people's time and, and interest in the project, they can, they can dive a little bit into it, deep dive into it, or truly deep dive into it if you want to get into the, the technical papers. So it's in four parts. So the background, which has the project setting, uh, existing airspace, the reason why we're here, and the reason why we're putting this document together. Um, part B, 
um, talks about the journey in developing those flight paths and, and why we have to do what we have to do and, and indeed changes to other airports flight paths as well. Um, the actual environmental impact is in, in part C. So if you want to skip straight to what the impacts will be, um, go, go there. Uh, it covers all of those um, topic uh, headings which are set by the Environment Minister. Uh, it also includes the key mitigation. So these are the things that we're doing to offset the impact um, uh, to the environment, one of which is the noise insulation and property acquisition policy, which we'll get to a bit later on uh, this evening. Um, and also we talk about uh, synthesis environmental management and mitigation issues um, in part D. Um, I will say it's a digital EIS um, really makes navigating through it online very, very easy if, if you don't want to go through the, the paper copy. Paper copies are at all of, if not most of your local government um, libraries, but reach out to my team, uh, please, if you're unsure where to find one. Um, but, but for those who, who want an easy to use interactive way of navigating through the document, um, we'll show you the digital EIS a bit later on, and that'll show you how to reach the various pieces of, of information. Uh, next slide, thanks. So we, we like to show this slide to, to give um, to give the community an idea of of the I guess the, the challenge the problem when it comes to designing flight paths for for Western Sydney International and what you can see uh, on this slide is the flights to and from um, Kingsford Smith so you see the 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 red and the green there on the uh, right side of the image going out there to mascot. If you track a little bit over to the left of the slide, you'll see a little patch of blue and orange. That is Bankstown uh, General Aviation, predominantly airport, but also emergency services. If you track down again to the, the left of the image, but going a little bit more towards the bottom, you'll see an orange um, patch on there, and that is Camden, the other general aviation uh, airport uh, in the Sydney Basin. And then if you go up, Towards the top of the slide, you'll see RAF Base uh, Richmond, which is uh, a major defence uh, air base uh, for serving a number of defence um, facilities. So in, in that very complex picture, we, we have to fit a, a major new uh, international and domestic uh, airport in a way that is absolutely safe and safety is our top priority. And that very much dictates a large amount of the flight path choices that will run you through uh, tonight, so safety is not negotiable. That's the number one rule. Um, but the Western Sydney Airport Plan sets out a whole range of other principles that we are required uh, to follow, mostly all very common sense, like avoiding overflights in residential areas, avoiding unnecessary disruption to other airports, uh, and so on. Uh, and you'll see those in, in the, the documentation that, that we have released. Just in the interest of time, I, I won't go through all of them, but I will say that they are very much informed by community feedback that we received in 2015 uh, and 2016 from the environmental assessment process for the build uh, of the airport. Uh, and and it, it, um, it very clearly commits the government to working with the community to come up with a set of flight paths that is obviously safe, but also minimises any um, impact to community members insofar as is possible. Okay, just a, a quick recap. So many of you would, would know this all already, but these are important principles to understand when looking at the flight paths we present uh, to you. So first and foremost, uh, there's one physical runway. It's runway 0523. You can see it there on the image uh, on the right. But that runway can be used in five uh, different ways. And for each of those different ways, there's a completely different set of flight paths. So if aircraft were to approach from the uh, southwest and take off to the northeast, that's called runway 05. And 05 simply refers to 50 degrees magnetic, which is the alignment uh, of the runway. Uh, and we can operate that direction on the runway in both a day mode uh, and a night mode. And a night mode for the purposes of, of um, I guess, airports and flight path design is from 11 p.m. to 5.30 a.m. So we call it day, day evening because uh, clearly, most people um, sensibly think that night begins before uh, 11 p.m. The reason why we do have a night mode uh, for this airport is because Sydney Kingsford Smith is subject to a curfew, and that opens up a lot more of the airspace uh, from that 11 p.m. Uh, time slot. So runway uh, 05, both day and night, approaches from the southwest and departs to the northeast. 
the reverse direction, so arriving from the northeast and departing to the southwest, we call that runway 23. And that aligns with 230 degrees uh, magnetic. And again, there are day modes and night modes. Um, then there's the fifth runway mode, which only essentially utilizes um, one end of the, of the runway, which is that southwestern end. So we call that reciprocal runway operations. And in that runway mode, aircraft approach from the southwest to land, but also take off to the southwest. So, that, so there's no aircraft departing over that northeastern threshold uh, of the runway. Um, obviously, because we have aircraft both departing and arriving, flying towards each other, that does uh, have a significant impact both on safety and capacity of the airport. So that essentially really cuts down the number of aircraft that would use that mode at any one time, just because we need to have a greater safety separation because of the closing speed rates of the aircraft but that is an important option for um for the planners to use at, at various points and that is there because there is much less residential intensification to the southwestern edge uh, of the airport and therefore fewer people disturbed uh, by that noise just before we go to the the noise tool which i'll give um everyone a quick run through it's important to understand what we've modeled here so western sydney airport is is an airport currently under construction there is no flight schedule and I know the airport's working with airlines now to determine what um, what flights will operate to there in the future so we've had to construct what we call a synthetic flight schedule in order to do the modeling and um, particularly of the noise impacts to communities so we call those um, synthetic schedules um, and then we've had to also um, construct a model where the runway those five modes is used in various different times so there's no run one way mode that will be used 100% of the time. So we foresee that this airport will use, say, runway mode day 05 at some parts of the day, day 23 at other parts of the day, and obviously uh, night 5 and night 23 in a reciprocal runway operations at different uh, parts of the night, but also different nights of the week. Um, so we've had to construct those models to create three scenarios which we can model, and we call those balanced. So the first scenario is where each end of the runway is used equally, hence the, the term balanced. The second is uh, runway day 05 preferred and at night reciprocal runway operations. So that's the second of the scenarios we've modeled. And the third is uh, runway 23 day with reciprocal runway operations uh, at night. You'll see in the EIS, for those who really want to deep dive into the product, that there's actually eight scenarios developed. We've modelled three just in the interest of providing comprehensive information to the community. But, but, but you know, the, those eight um, scenarios really give you an idea of all the different ways in which the airport can be used. Um, and one of the things that we're doing after this EIS process is starting to work with um, experts and the community to put together that model of how we expect it to be used in practice. But for now, we have our, our 05 preferred, 23 preferred and balanced scenarios. So with that in mind, um, Oscar, can you jump into the noise tool, uh, please? Okay, now what you see there is runway day 05. So you can see there the purple uh, flight pass illustrate aircraft taking off to the northeast. Um, arriving aircraft coming in from the northeast uh, uh, sorry, coming in from the southwest uh, to land, uh, that's in the yellow. Uh, and this is day. So um, while we do have a few aircraft tracking east across uh, closer to Kingsford Smith, you can see that on the right side of that image, it is largely free of our, our traffic because that is taken up by Kingsford Smith uh, aircraft. So I don't want to dwell on these too much. I just really want to show you what's there. Um, just as one demonstration, Oscar, could you just double click on, say, uh, a purple flight path? And you can just double click, please, and you'll see that address comes up. Um, that will give you uh, an address specific readout of um, the impacts of aircraft over that address and shows you the relevant flight paths. And Oscar, if you don't mind just clicking on one of the flight paths, just in the pop up box there to the left you'll see an animated video of that flight path uh, come up for those. Um, so once you put in your address there, and you can type your address in the search box as well, you don't have to do the double click a maneuver. You can see um, the aircraft, um, in this case, a departing aircraft to the southwest, 
and where your, your residence or, or other area of interest might be um, under what we call a sound cloud there. So the colours represent the degree of um, noise expected to be incurred underneath the aircraft uh, at that point. Next, Oscar, if you go to runway uh, day two, three. So this is traffic during the day in the opposite uh, direction. So you can see the um, arrival aircraft there in the yellow coming in from the northeast and departing aircraft taking off uh, to the southwest. Uh, again, there's a couple of aircraft um, flight paths tracking to the east there near Kingsford Smith. But for the most part, we leave that piece of airspace free. Uh, and then um, day, uh, sorry, 05 night. So this is the other direction again, aircraft taking off to the northeast uh, and arriving uh, from the southwest, but this is at night. So 11 p.m. to 5.30 a.m. And they look completely different again. Uh, and generally the night modes, we've been able to get those further away from the community because there are just less constraints um, in the airspace area. Then two, three night. Again, so aircraft arriving from the northeast departing to the uh, southwest uh, as well. Again, 11 p.m. to 5.30 a.m. And reciprocal one-way operations, our fifth mode. And you can see there the aircraft, uh, what we call head-to-head -head mode. So purple is the departures. And one thing to note, I guess, from, from that uh, flight path is we pull aircraft off center line very quickly after departure. They're, they're going sort of a hard left, hard right. And that's to get them out of the way of the oncoming, um, incoming uh, arriving aircraft uh, there in yellow. So it's, it's a very different sort of flight path mode. Um, and, and as you can see, for the reasons that I've mentioned, um, it concentrates the, the community impacts uh, on uh, the southwestern uh, part of that airport uh, there. Um, I might just show you one uh, noise map just so that um, you're aligned with the product and you can see what it looks like. So here we have the um, assessment scenario, um, no preference. So I mentioned no preference prefer runway 05 or prefer 23. So this is no preference. Uh, one of our three assessment years, so we've assessed at 2033, 2040 and 2055, representing different stages of maturity of a single runway uh, airport. And this particular contour is for N70. So the N70 contour is, is a really good example of those areas where we think the noise impact is sufficient to disturb living amenities. So, um, that's why we, we do N70. What it effectively means is that even inside your house, um, there's sufficient noise to penetrate uh, the building and disturb a reasonable conversation uh, between uh, two people. Um, um, if you just click on an N60 uh, there, Oscar, um, these contours are much broader. So, you know, in, just because you're in an N60 contour doesn't necessarily mean that there's any disruption to, to living amenity. It can be for some that there's an extraordinary variance in people's tolerance and perceptions of aircraft noise. Some some people won't be bothered by being in these contours at all and, and, and others others will be quite quite disturbed. So we, we, sort of, we make no view on that. Um, everybody is different and everybody's reaction is 100% legitimate. Um, but, but generally, if you're in the outer parts of these N60 contours, we're, we're not anticipating, um, particularly in that light blue area, we're not anticipating significant community um, disruption uh, from flight paths. Um, and just then the ANEC there, Oscar, if you can just put that one up. Our contour are largely put together for land planning uh, purposes. So this, this guides land planning agencies um, uh, as, as well as users um, about those areas where they can expect um, more significant noise impact. Um, as you can see, most ANECs, in fact, all ANECs generally follow the alignment of the runway. And that's a pretty consistent theme in all, in all flight path designs and, and modelling, uh, not just Western Sydney. Look, uh, super conscious of the time, I will show you um, some changes to other airports just very quickly. So if you don't mind zooming out. So, look, um, if you recall that image I showed you with flight paths from all of the other uh, aerodromes and the city basin already, we have had to, uh, for safety reasons, make some adjustments to, to other aerodromes to ensure safe separation uh, between Western Sydney aircraft and aircraft that are arriving to or departing from those other aerodromes. So this is an example we've, we've pulled up here for Sydney Kingsford Smith. So this is um, for departures off runway 25. So runway 25 is the east-west 
uh, runway for those who know mascot uh, well, and it's the end, it's the western end, so aircraft taking off uh, to the west as opposed to the eastern end out over the Pacific Ocean. And one of the changes here is if you look at the pink, which is the existing flight path, you can see it goes directly over Western Sydney Airport, creating a significant safety issue for aircraft, both from Kingsford Smith and going to Western Sydney Airport. Um, and that's one reason why we've had to shift um, those flight paths uh, from uh, runway 25 heading to the west and to the north from the pink to the purple areas. So instead of tracking uh, for some time before doing gentle turns to the right or, or more turn to go to the west or a more significant turn um, to the right to go to the north, we will move aircraft off the uh, runway heading reasonably quickly with a right turn and track them up towards uh, Parramatta. Uh, up around Parramatta, there's a start of a, a line, which you can see there in purple, that goes through across Penrith to Katoomba. And that is a, what we call a, a sort of a safe corridor. So aircraft are then funneled into that corridor where they can transit the western part of the city and be 100% guaranteed of being um, safely separated uh, or going well from, from any another flight pass in the Sydney Basin. So, and there are a range of uh, vertical navigation requirements through that uh, Granville to Katoomba um, corridor. And you'll see if we go to runway uh, 34, uh, Oscar, very similar concept. So we, we send up aircraft more or less um, on a more tightly confined flight path for runway 34, but heading up towards uh, Granville if you want to go to the west or to the north, uh, and then into that um, safe corridor out to the west, or if you're going to the north, um, veering up towards uh, RAF base, which means where they'll overfly that at some, some altitude. Um, if we just go back to 2.5, there's just one note I'd like to, to make on that, and that is that this image is perhaps a bit more dramatic than it looks because we can see a big shift in the flight path. It's worth noting that runway 2.5, the east-west runway and the western end of it, is only used less than 4% of the time at Kingsford Smith. It really is rarely used, and the, the data I have for August to September, is, I think August is around 1% and September might be around 3 it, it's it's not I guess it's not the the dramatic effect that the image looks like. So we have had some feedback from people looking at that image. They go, oh, this you know this is bad, and we get lots of aircraft over my house every day. Um, you know, and, and my lifestyle will be impacted by that. I, I just want to sort of put that note out that this runway is really only used when westerly uh, winds prevent the main north south runways from operating, or as part of a noise sharing. Uh, mode so that that is as I said um, generally four percent or less uh, of the time. If we go to one way three four, which is used a lot more of the time, we can see that the the change in flight pass is is much uh, sort of I guess less noticeable. It predominantly flies on the existing flight pass, but just in a tighter corridor. So we don't foresee that um, runway three four, which, which is used a lot more. Um, has has the same sort of noticeability effects that that runway two five does, but I just caution that runway two five um, is a is a rarely used runway. So um, um, if you see those images, I think just just, just take that in mind. Uh, maybe one last thing before we stop there is I'll just take us to Bankstown quickly, Oscar. Um, and so there are changes to Bankstown. Um, again, it's to achieve safe separation with uh, aircraft from Western Sydney uh, International. Generally, most of our changes to the other aerodromes have been to reduce the discretion of aircraft to fly over a wide part of Sydney. Because we have so many more aircraft in the basin, we really need to know where those aircraft are at any given point uh, in time, both laterally and vertically. So. Um, what you probably can't see here, and Oscar, if you don't mind just double clicking on the purple uh, line, um, what you can see there is, is that instead of aircraft being spread generally across um, um, a large part of Sydney, they are st stuck to those, those purple lines. And if you just go to runway 11 departures, the same thing. So. Um, ordinarily, aircraft from Bankstown will be departing all over that area, uh, a solid uh, piece of green. Um, but, but now we will require them to be in that purple area just to absolutely guarantee safe separation from uh, Western Sydney uh, 
international aircraft. Look, there are pros and cons for this kind of aircraft management. Um, the pro for some people is that there will be now very few, if any, aircraft over their residences. The con, unfortunately, for some, some more people is that um, aircraft will be more concentrated uh, over their areas of sensitivity. So we just do want to acknowledge that uh, right up front. Look, I, I think I, I've spoken enough uh, for now, so I might just stop there and um, we can go all day on, on these flight paths. It's a very complex piece, but I might just stop there and um, and take questions. Thanks, David. Thank you so much for that. It was a pretty hard task to get through all of that in such a short time. And again, I just remind people that there is a more detailed explanation of the flight paths for Western Sydney International um, on the previous recording that we did do early in the year that is on the website. David goes a bit slower in that explanation, so I um, encourage you to watch that. Otherwise, please come along to any of our community events that we've got coming up. We will put the details of those up on the screen um, towards the end of the session, but the details are also available on the Western Sydney um, we see flightpaths.gov.au website as well. The other thing you can also do is call our 1800 number and speak to a member of the team as well. So apologies, I know that was a little pacey, um, but we are trying to um, get through as much as we can in tonight's session and particularly focus on the draft environmental impact statement and also on the draft noise insulation and property acquisition policy as well. So the team's been answering a few questions um, in the Q&A directly, but David, I did want to draw your attention to two questions. Um, one is around the modelling um, that's been used um, for Western Sydney International question is, is the same modelling, is it the same modelling that was used for Brisbane Airport used for Western Sydney International? That modelling was not accurate and ended up being far from reality when it was um, in operation in Brisbane. No, there's, there's a couple of very key differences. One, one is um, since uh, Brisbane modelling was done, we've moved to a new modelling framework. So that was INM from, from memory. Uh, we've used is something called the Aviation Environment Design Tool, uh, version 3E, which is developed by the Federal Aviation Administration, but adapted to uh, Australia. Uh, we think it's, it's more accurate in terms of modelling those um, noise and other environmental impacts. It's not just a noise um, tool. Um, look, we're, we've also looked hard at at Brisbane, we, we are deeply conscious of the community reaction to some of Brisbane's flight paths, and we've not made some of the assumptions that were made uh, in the Brisbane context. Now, I just want to be clear, I'm not having a dig uh, at Brisbane, but, but a couple of those examples, uh, Brisbane didn't really model non-jet aircraft. Um, we have. Um, Brisbane made some assumptions around downwind uh, speeds on their main runway, um, which were probably a bit higher than then, um, which, which we're done in Brisbane, but 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 not consistent with the international standard. We, we haven't done that. So we haven't modelled 10 knot downwinds, for example. We've modelled five. Uh, and the area in which we've modelled, um, the area in which we've modelled um, is much larger than what, what Brisbane modelled. So we're, we're going out to 45 nautical miles um, as, as a base area of modelling, which is a substantially larger area of, of ground than what Brisbane did. I just do want to say I'm not having a go at Brisbane, that the science moves on just like every other human endeavour. Um, and it's just we can benefit from those lessons that were learnt in Brisbane. Thanks, David. Another question for you. Do the models take into consideration the existing ambient noise? Uh, yes, they do. And you can see those ambient noise measurements um, in the technical appendices. So we had 29 uh, noise monitoring terminals throughout um, the Western Sydney and Blue Mountains area. And... Um, uh, all the results in there over, I think, a two-week period for memory um, are in the technical appendices for, for those who, who want to have a look. And, David, um, one of the questions here is, wasn't there a commitment that there was no convergence points would exist? So going back to sort of the 12 principles in the in the aircraft design, so if you could explain that in a little bit. Yeah, that, that's right. So the, the convergence point issue arose as a result of community feedback from the 2015-16 EIS where they adopted a different flight path design uh, method. Um and, and, what, and what that did was that we had a range of aircraft coming into a, a particular point on the map, and then, then it was over Blacksland, uh, and then following a single track into the Sydney Basin uh, to, to land at the Western Sydney Airport. So um, there was significant community reaction to that, um, and one of the, the very early decisions the government made in response to that is we wouldn't adopt 
um, a, what we call a merge point approach. So not convergence, it's a merge point approach for this, which which is why when you see our flight pass, the, you know, the, there's flight pass literally sort of going in all directions, depending on which mode you, you use. And that's because we're, we're definitely not following that, that approach. Um, look, the, again, the pro is that the noise is is, is more spread around the community. The, the, the con is that everybody gets a bit, I think, and some areas get more than others. So we're very conscious uh, of that as well. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, and perhaps, perhaps the last question for you before I move on to Damien. Could, um, somebody's asking, couldn't you have significant numbers of aircraft in the transition areas that we've shown on the noise tool on the modelling? It, it depends entirely on the transition area. So if we were to look at, for example, the Kingswood Smith flight path, so we've got a transition area coming off runway three, four, heading north and out to what we call shore. So for only oceanic destinations, you know, LA, Auckland, you know, um, Fiji, for example, they they can transition off that flight path um, very early on, and that's those are sort of higher capacity routes. So you might have more aircraft in those transition areas. But we also have non-jet transition areas over the northern part of the Blue Mountains, for example, and I think that the numbers of aircraft going through those are very small indeed. So it really does depend on uh, the, the des destination, uh, the originating airport and time of day and runway mode. Terrific. Thanks, David. Lots of questions coming through. Some of them relate to some of the information which Damien's going to talk to just um, in a few moments but um, I just wanted to recognize that there are a lot of questions coming in there's a lot of people online so we are trying to get through um, as many different questions as we can um, and I'll hand over to Damien now who's going to talk about the draft environmental impact statement and sort of the key methodology and the key findings of that and some of the questions that have come through I'll try and pick up again when we pause for questions after Damien's presentation but thanks David and over to you Damien. Thanks, Deb, and hi to everyone that's online. Um, yeah, so as as David spoke to, the EIS is is a very large document. It's, it's eight volumes. I think it's twenty six chapters, a, a whole range of supporting technical papers. So there's there's a huge amount of information that we could could get to. Um, it's the culmination of many many months' work by a, a very large extended team of people that really do specialise in in their chosen fields. So in the timeframes we've got tonight, I'll try and give some background to the, the key assessments um, within the EIS. And obviously we'll, we'll have a look and discuss the main you know, impact assessment and findings that, that we came up with. Just before I do though, um, it, it's kind of important to outline, I guess, what the EIS uh, assesses. So it, it's looked at the, the development and implementation of these um, proposed flight paths, uh, including new controlled airspace for, for single runway operations only. Um, it, it's very important to delineate the difference between this project that being the flight paths and impacts from the airport or stage one, which David spoke about. Um, the development of it also, the AIS also assesses um, air traffic control and noise abatement procedures for eventual use by um, civil and commercial uh, freight aircraft. And, and as David also spoke to just then, it assesses um, a, a range of adjustments to Sydney Basin airspace. So those changes to existing flight paths for Kingswood Smith, Bankstown, uh, Rough Base Richmond, Orchid Hills, et cetera. Um, and there's a, there's a technical paper and chapters within the EIS called Facilitated Changes. Um, what else? So the, the EIS, when we do EISs, uh, we, we're generally given terms of reference or guidelines on, under the Commonwealth process. Um, and so this AIS has been undertaken and prepared to address the relevant requirements of uh, the Airports Act, uh, the EPBC Act, which is the Federal Commonwealth legislation. Um, it's been prepared to meet the minister's guidelines, which were issued for, for, for us to, you know, come up with a range of assessments meeting certain guidelines. Um, and also with regards to a range of sort of standards, including air services standards and air services being operators of, of flight space in Australia. So we'll move on then to, uh, we'll go through some key topics and then I'm sure there'll be a, a bunch of questions at the end. Um, David's pretty much covered off on, on most of the kind of noise impact and I'm sure there'll be some questions on that, but I'll, I'll move straight on to air quality and greenhouse gas assessment. Um, as with most of the assessments that if you've had a look at the AIS, there's generally two assessment or reference years were assessed um, for, for a whole range of things. And that was 2033, which 
represents single runway operations hand, handling up to around 10 million passengers. And then a, a 2055 reference year as well, which is also single runway operations, but reaching capacity um, at around 37 million passengers. So it's, it's that point where it's at its capacity and the second runway may or may not be needed at that point. And then also for a lot of the assessments, particularly air quality, greenhouse gas, um, uh, a number of flight scenarios were then, were then modeled or assessed um, the, the three key ones being a, a no preference scenario or prefer runway 05 or prefer runway 03, just depending on which runway is being used at, at which mode of operation. Uh, and, and they've generally been chosen to identify or represent the worst case for potential air quality impacts um, to give it a conservative nature. Uh, for air quality, we also looked at um, two different study areas. So there's a localised study area, which is generally 10 kilometres from the, the centre of the Western Sydney Airport, uh, and then a regional study area, which uh, was a quali qu qualitative assessment looking at a much larger area, essentially the, um, the Sydney Basin region. Um, the, the assessment of air quality looked at applicable national air quality standards, state impact assessment criteria were also used to, to look at acceptable impacts or, or compliance by the project. And, and principally they, they defined things like the New South Wales EPA approved methods for modeling of assessment of air quality and air pollution in, in New South Wales was, was applied. Um, additionally, in order to include consideration of the potential health issues that could arise from exposure to toxic air, air toxics. Um, investigation levels were identified for five pollutants uh, in ambient uh, air quality modeling. And that's things like benzene, xylene, toluene, just th they meet a whole bunch of criteria and, and standards that we need to assess under those guidelines. So looking at the, um, the impacts that we assessed, I guess the, uh, the summary is that for all of the key um, air quality criteria that assessed um, pollutants were below the identified thresholds in 2033. Uh, there were some minor exceedances that could occur close to the airport itself for particulate matter PM 2.5 uh, and nitrogen dioxide in 2055. Um, there was elevated particulate matter levels uh, due to existing elevated background levels generally. Uh, the com it, it's difficult to accurately assess the contribution of WSI flight paths um, but we believe that the contribution from them is considered insignificant. Uh, and the predicted one hour average nitrogen dioxide levels are slightly above the New South Wales Environmental Protection Authority criteria. Uh, and, and due to the conservative nature of, of the assessment are likely to be an overestimate anyway. Uh, it's, it's important to note actually that the air quality standards aren't designed to be applied to specific projects. They're, their sort of average exposure to air pollutants for general populations, areas, or, or, or the state. Um, the pollutants that we assessed were carbon monoxide, uh, organic compounds, uh, organic gases, oxides of nitrogen, so nitrogen dioxide, uh, sulfur oxides, and the, and the particulate matters of two, PM 2.5 and, and PM 10. Uh, there's a comment there on fuel jettisoning and uh, it's certainly a question we've been asked of uh, a fair bit. Um, the, the risk is very small, fuel jettisoning. Um, it's a relatively uncommon. It's, it's a non-standard operational requirement um, that generally has no ground level impacts if carried out in accordance with proper procedures. Um, there are fuel jettisoning uh, procedures that's called under the Manual of Air Traffic Services. Um, and essentially there'd be no significant adverse impacts associated with fuel, fuel jettisoning associated with operation of the flight paths from Western Sydney International. Uh, it can never be guaranteed that they don't occur. However, um, the historical records, the, these things are all recorded, indicates that they're very rare events. And, and David might know the numbers better than I am, but um, from 2010 to 2022, I think from around 9 million flights, there was there was a very small amount of um, events where this occurred. So I just thought I'd discuss that early on because I know there'll probably be a few questions uh, related to that. So really just a summary on air quality and, and greenhouse gas uh, issues that um, all, all the relevant criteria and pollutants were assessed um, in 2033 
not, nothing exceeded the, the health thresholds uh, and there were only minor exceedances in 2055. And, and I think 2055 is a, uh, a reference year that's it's difficult to model given how far it is. We don't know what the fleet, the, the planes will look like, um, what fuels they'll be using, all that kind of stuff. But um, there was no significant impacts from air quality. Uh, greenhouse ga gases as well. Uh, we, we did look at that. So the greenhouse gas emissions are generally categorized into three scopes. There's a direct emissions called scope one. So that's, you know, emissions coming from the, the, the jets themselves. Uh, scope two, indirect emissions, which is from the offset of uh, offsite generation of purchased electricity, which is consumed. Uh, and then scope three, which is really indirect things um, it, with regards to an airport would be things like third party fleet vehicles, staff commuting to and from the airport. And it's not really relevant to this pro project. Um, the purpose of the assessment for greenhouse gas was to calculate emissions produced in the engine exhaust behind the aircraft. Uh, so using the flight paths and the route network in the early years of operation from opening. Um, and so that assessment as well also looked at total greenhouse gas emissions for all phases of flights. So that was both arriving and departing below 3,000 feet. There was then a 10,000 feet um, arrival and departure um, threshold. And then total greenhouse uh, gas emissions, which are expressed as uh, CO2 equivalent for all projected one-way flights. So leaving WSI and, and on the anticipated route network. So departures only. Um, and yeah, it, it found that... Uh, it was the, the greenhouse gas emissions were not going to impact Australia's um, target, uh, greenhouse gas targets. Um, I think that's probably all, um, Deb, for the next slide, please. Landscape and visual impacts. Um, so this really was, there was quite a lot of work um, undertaken on this. It, uh, the, the assessment is based on three, the potential for three key aspects of the project and how it'll affect uh, key land uses in the study area. So those being, um, oops, sorry, just bounced my mouse there. Sorry, let me jump down a bit further. Um, a range of, of issues. So uh, again, two study areas. We did a local one, which was around 15 kilometers from WSI and a regional one, uh, which was close to 50 kilometers, so uh, northwest, west and southwest from WSI, and also included um, areas of the Greater Blue Mountains area. Again, we looked at um, 2033 and 2055 reference years. And the methodology for um, landscape and visual impact assessment broadly includes identification of broad landscape character areas, and their zones that reflect the qualities of the built natural and cultural environment of those areas. Uh, and the starting point for that was the 2016 uh, stage one AIS, and we really built on those um, landscape to, uh, landscape character areas. Uh, we also included zones um, for the for the Greater Blue Mountains area. And the methodology, the, the process involves identification of significant viewpoints and vistas identified uh, in the review of relevant planning instruments, strategies, and, and field observations, peak teams going out into the field preparation of uh, a whole bunch of photo montages you, you may have seen in the EIS um, from, from those selected viewpoints. And, and for each of those montages and images prepared that in, generally provides a line showing the flight path and multiple aircraft silhouetted along that flight path. And then we assess the, the likely magnitude of change. And so within the EIS, you might see terms very high, high, moderate or, or low. And so they really represent um, the severity or the importance of that location as well. So very high, for example, might mean the landscape's altered such that the project uh, transforms its character and results in a severe change to the landscape character of, of, of a site, whereas high is a little bit less than that and it, and it drops down from there. Um, so looking at the impacts of uh, landscape and visual amenity from the flight paths, uh, I guess the key takeouts are that uh, impacts at certain Greater Blue Mountains areas, uh, being Echo Point and the walls, have been assessed as high to moderate. And, and really, that is based on um, the sensitivity of those sites. So it's not that the actual uh, magnitude of change at those sites from putting new, new planes or flight paths near them or planes in the air is, is particularly high, but it just really represents how, in, you know, how sensitive and how important those areas are. Um, and so that's why they were deemed to have a high to moderate impact uh, in 2055. 
Um, the magnitude of visual change was deemed to be low, though, as aircraft will be in considerable distance. They're, they're at altitude at that point um, when, you, when you're at those lookouts. Uh, all other, there was a whole, there was a number of viewpoints we took from the Blue Mountains area, um, and all the rest were assessed as either moderate, moderate low, or negligible impact. There are also a number of um, viewpoints in proximity to the airport, Camps Creek and Ludnam Village. Um, they had they were assessed as high to moderate um, in 2055 scenario, and, and that really is based on their proximity to the airport and the, and the frequency of, um, of expected overflight. So obviously, as you get closer to the the runway takeoff and um, landing kind of lines, there's most of the flight paths are lining up along the airport along those lines. So there's there's a large number of of planes um, that will be visual, visible from that area. Um, next one, please, Deb. Land use. Um, land use is an interesting one. I guess uh, what we did here was we, we looked at three kind of key, you can see on the map there. So the study area for the land use looked at the key kind of land use planning instruments that could be affected. So what you can see on the map there is the broader circle is the obstacle limitation surface for the airport. I, I, I don't think it's really worth discussing here. It's it's really around um, breaching a very high sort of, you know, nothing's going to be built out there that's really going to impact that. I guess there could be some cranes during construction that, um, could, but for the general population, it's it's not really a, a key issue. Um, there's the you can see there the yellow the yellow blob in the middle of the map is the um, the ANEC the Australian Noise Exposure Concept, which David did speak to, but we'll get to a little bit more. And there's also some wildlife buffers, which is a, a thing that goes around all airports just to maintain certain land uses to restrict the types of bird life essentially that um, can be attracted to the airport. Uh, and so the assessment looked at all those. It looked at noise, the, uh, how that affects planning, uh, potential for restricted development due to those prescribed airspace things, so, such as OLS, uh, and then the wildlife buffer framework. So in general, the New South Wales planning framework, it takes a very precautionary approach to residential land use in regard to the airport. And, and these restrictions, planning restrictions have been in place for quite a while um, in advance of the airport being um, prepared and developed. Uh, the, there's a number of residential dwellings currently located within the prescribed, which is the yellow mark line you can see there on the map, the prescribed um, ANEC 20 contour, uh, areas such as Ludnam, Silverdale, Twin Creeks, Golf and Country Club. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of scattered rural residential properties um, in that broader Ludnam, Badgerys Creek, Greendale kind of area. Um, and it, it's important to note, I guess, that existing residential land uses within that ANEC 20 contour can continue in the future due to, you know, existing land use rights. Uh, and the, a whole bunch of planning documents, so the Western City Parkland SEP or your LEPs, um, they outline restrictions around, around new developments. So in general, no new, no new noise sensitive developments, which is things such as residential development, schools, et cetera, are permitted within the 20, the ANEC 20 contour and above. Um, there's obviously exceptions to that for houses and subdivisions that were permissible before it came into effect. And there's conditionally acceptable, uh, you know, some developments may be conditionally acceptable under by consent authorities like your local council, um, if you can achieve certain internal noise goals, et cetera. Uh, but essentially, I, I guess what the, the main takeaway from this really is that um, a whole range of land use planning controls have been in place um, based on the long term dual runway ANEC, which is the one that you can see there. We modelled a, a, a single runway ANEC for the project. Um, and you can see the little blue hashed areas there where for the 2055 modelled ANEC, it, it extends beyond what the prescribed or the legislated. ANEC is, and, and essentially any updates to existing planning protections would be based on a revised dual runway ANEC, which um, would be prepared during the detailed design phase. Um, next, please, Deb. Biodiversity. Uh, again, uh, a lot of work went into this. Um, let me just find my notes here. So there was only one 
study area we did for this, it was it was very broad. It was around 45 nautical miles or 80, just a bit over 80 kilometers. Uh, again, most of the Sydney Basin. Um, the assessment considered both direct and indirect impacts. So direct being wildlife strike, essentially. Uh, indirect impacts such as noise, changes in air and water quality, increased light, et cetera, on behavior of, of certain species. And, and essentially the methodology for that was a desktop review of existing literature and databases followed by what's called a likelihood of occurrence assessment for threatened flora and ecological communities. Um, and really restrict those ones restricted to what would occur within the wildlife buffers, which we just spoke about in the planning stage. Um, and that's around a 13 kilometer radius from the airport. Um, flying fox assessment, however, did go significantly beyond those wildlife buffers of 13 kilometers out to around 30 kilometers. Um, and it, we, we looked at a whole range of um, numerous flying fox camps outside of that area. Um, Bird and bat strikes uh, are known to occur in, uh, within the vicinity of airports. Um, the level of impacts being assessed as low or not significant for WSI. Indirect impacts were considered, um, as I mentioned, light spill, air quality. Uh, noise noise for, um, for species. So then the N60, which we spoke about just before, and N70, 24-hour noise contours, are generally used as a proxy to assess the extent of aircraft noise on biodiversity values. Um, that noise level threshold of 60 um, dBA represents a, a reasonably conservative noise threshold based on... Um, published literature and findings from previous airports. Um, and all other impacts were assessed as, as negligible from a biodiversity um, perspective. Uh, the, the Greater Blue Mountains area, uh, there's, a, there's a standalone paper um, in the EIS for that. Uh, and we've it's been identified that it wouldn't have a significant impact on any of the attributes um, for the World Heritage criteria of the Blue, Greater Blue Mountains. Um, it's outstanding uh, universal value uh, and it wouldn't impact the integrity of the Blue Mountains area at all. Next one, please, Deb. Economic assessments. Um, so uh, the, the key to this really is looking at that the, the overall benefit of, of the airport. Um, we assessed it based on four key aspects, the ac economic activity uh, and employment in the local government areas of, within the study or surrounding the airport, property values and land use, uh, social impacts and tourism, the impacts to that, and, and then obviously the facilitated changes we spoke of before and how that could affect other uh, aviation uses. So things like Bankstown, for, exam for example. Um, the flight paths really are integral to, you know, the, the airport's a catalyst for a whole range of development that's going to occur in Western Sydney, um, Aerotropolis being the main one, obviously, and the employment benefits of that. Uh, it increased access to key tourist destinations, and, and that really is considered to outweigh potential adverse amenity impacts of the flight paths for, for the Western Sydney. Um, aircraft noise may result in adverse impacts to residential property values in some areas close to the airport. Um, dwellings in particular within the N70 contour and that are outside of the ANEC 20 expected to have a, a low level of impact. Uh, potential losses are expected to be recovered just through the general growth in capital gain. Um, I, I guess the 2016 AIS assessed the potential impact of noise on property values uh, by land use types based on the analysis of, I think it was Brisbane Adelaide airports and, and a range of other supporting studies. And, and there's other international studies as well. And, and it doesn't essentially find a, a statistically significant relationship between noise exposure and housing prices. Um, and as I said, broadly, the analysis indicates that property values are impacted negatively in short term. Uh, during construction and operation of the airport, and I guess by nature of the flight paths as well. Um, but then stronger land value gains for neighbouring properties in the years following operation of the, uh, of the airport. Uh, next one, please, Deb. Human health. So the human health uh, assessment was really uh, informed uh, by a bunch of the other technical papers, some of which we've already discussed, so noise and air quality in particular. Um, 
And the assessment was carried out in accordance with national and international guidance with, that's endorsed or accepted by Australian health and environmental authorities. Um, it focused on health-related impacts associated with key issues of air quality, noise, hazard and risk aspects. Um, and it was informed, as I said, by, by most of the other reports as well. If you, if you do read it, you'll note um, some key terminology in there, things such as, uh, you, you know, there's rankings and it's no health impacts of concern or negligible. And, and that really means that uh, exposure levels or concentrations quantified are below guidelines for adverse health effects um, to the community or are so low that they're effectively considered to be indistinguishable from zero. So um, quite a lot of the assessment you read in there either is listed as no health impacts of concern or low. And low just means um, exposure levels or concentrations are equal to guidelines for adverse health effects um, and could result in some amenity impacts, but no health impacts. So the assessment didn't identify any significant risks to community health associated with air quality changes due to the project. Uh, and I guess that reflects the findings from the air quality paper as well. Um, in locations close to the runway and, and below the immediate arrival and departure flight paths, aircraft noise does have the potential to result in increases in sleep disturbance and annoyance and to a lesser degree, learning delays for children. Um, I, I guess that can sound a little controversial, but so that those learning delays, um, the, the World Health Organization has criteria that identifies, you know, a, a threshold of learning delay being one month delay, like 30 days uh, in reading or oral comprehension, um, which is which is what the World Health Organization adopts as the level of cognitive impairment for the purposes of establishing those guidelines. Um, our AI didn't found that um, for a whole bunch of schools and daycare, childcare centers uh, within the vicinity of the airport, um, they would experience much, much less than that. There was, there was, we weren't even close to those, um, those thresholds that the World Health Organization uses. Um, the affected areas are mostly located um, in the in the ANEC 20 contours, which we showed that map just before. Uh, and and that, those areas contain less than 500 residents uh, by 2040. Uh, and as we mentioned before, those areas are already subject to planning controls for noise sensitive developments. Um, moving on, Deb. Ah, that's it. Uh, that, just on that, I guess there was also, a, uh, I have I, at some of the, the community consultation sessions that we've been to publicly, I guess I've been asked around hearing impairment, uh, that, health, that health paper also mentions that. Um, uh, there's also World Health Organization thresholds relevant to hearing impairment. Um, and the assessment found that there are no predicted, um, the maximum levels of noise for all scenarios evaluated for 2055, so when it's louder in theory, at any of the noise sensitive receivers wouldn't, wouldn't get close to any of those thresholds as well. Um, I think that's it for, for health, Deb. Great. Thanks so much, Damien. And um, what a tour that was of 4,000 pages in such a short time. <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's, there's so much to talk through. I mean, the AIS, I, I, the digital AIS in particular, I think it's very worth people navigating through that, reading the chapters. They provide a very concise summary of some pretty heavy technical uh, supporting technical reports. Mm -hmm. um, at the front of each of those chapters is a, what we call an exec summary, I guess, which gives uh, a, you know a page summary of those chapters as well. Uh, yeah, and look, look forward to people reading that and providing any comments during the public exhibition period. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, we'll talk through um, with everybody online to those kind of levels of information that we've got available as well. So we'll walk through that on the on the website too, so people can see um, how that sort of cascading information, if you want to you know, really delve into a key topic that's of interest to you or if you just want to get sort of a high level overview as well. Um, there's lots of questions that have been coming through the Q&A and the team's been trying to answer as many of those as possible in the in written format, but there's some that I'm going to take now in um, verbally into the room. So, David, I'm going to come back to you to start with. There's a question from someone, can we see the flight paths from KS, sorry, Sydney, Kingsford, Smith, um, WSI and Bankstown and other airports that will be overflying the um, Linden uh, Falcon Bridge area on one map? Thanks, David. 
Uh, in short, no. Um, the, the, the noise tool isn't designed to, to do that. I'm, I'm very happy to describe them to you. And if, if you're comfortable, um, the questioner just going through the flight path, maybe just take some notes and you, you'll see them. You'll see them all. Um, David, do you want us uh, to get the tool up or? By, by all means, although I've, I've got it written down, yeah, but. Yeah, you know, okay, we'll just get that for other people's benefit. Thanks. Thank you. If we go to runway 23 day, so that's a five day. Yep. Great. And just zoom out of touch. Okay. So you'll see there that there is a departure flight path heading up to uh, the north from runway 23 day. Um, uh, the numbers of aircraft on that flight path range between 21 and 44, depending on how busy uh, the airport is and schedule, and they expect to be passing through that area between 10,500 feet and 13,300 feet. If you then go to um, reciprocal runway operations night, um, and zoom out a touch, Okay, I mentioned before that when we have aircraft flying towards each other in this mode, we pull aircraft off center line very quickly. So that right hand turn um, will direct aircraft heading to northern destinations again through um, the, the piece of the Great Western Highway between Linden and Falkenbridge. Uh, they will cross there between 8 and 10,500 feet. So 8,000 feet and 10,500 feet um, with a frequency of between 7 and 14 aircraft. Um, if we go to runway 05 night, um, and this time it's an arrival, so the yellow coming through between Linden and Falkenbridge uh, between 5 and 8,000 feet um, and 3 to 8 aircraft, depending on how busy the uh, airport is. Uh, and lastly, uh, runway 23 night. Uh, we have aircraft uh, departing um, uh, off runway 239, heading to both uh, north, west and eastern destinations um, between 6 and 14 aircraft, depending on how busy the airport is, uh, 10,500 to 13,300 uh, feet. But they're just given as a Blue, Mo Blue Mountains focus question. We also have an arrival flight path that crosses near Warramu. Uh, between five and eight thousand feet and four to eleven uh, aircraft, depending on schedule. Now, the question did ask about Kingsford Smith. Um, I will say that there has been a, a long-standing flight path from Kingsford Smith that more or less flies down the Great Western Highway. So um, that that isn't changing. It, it's there already, as as many people in the Blue Mountains tell us. Um, and I couldn't tell you how many aircraft there are on that, but that 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 won't be changing uh, under our model. Um, there may be a few more aircraft directed down that pathway just because of the changes to runway 25, as I explained earlier. Thanks, David, for that. Um, Damien, I'm going to go to a question for you now. Have the risks of pollution and contamination to Warragamba Dam been from increased aircraft movements been mitigated? In this case, uh, mm. it's Sorry, I knew I was going to be the first person to talk on mute. Um, so there is not a lot of uh, mitigation measures that can be, I, I mean, the, the operation of planes, and David might be able to speak better than me, but um, uh, so we've assessed, I guess the, the, the impacts from emissions can only come from two things, fuel jettisoning, and I think we've spoken about that, and it's a very rare event, and if fuel's jettisoned at a sufficient altitude, it volatizes as it falls and it's completely dispersed as vapour before you know, any liquid uh, reaches ground level. Uh, emissions from the planes, the, the same, and you know the assessment didn't identify that any um, water quality impacts would be, would be found from the basis of just general emissions from planes. Um, mitigation measures are limited for air quality. I mean, the planes 
uh, operated in a way that uh, generally tries to uh, minimize emissions during descent and takeoff operations. Um, but there's no there's no specific mitigations being identified for the protection of Warragamba Dam or, or other water sources, given that there's, uh, there's hasn't been assessed as needing to. I might just add to that that um, the the environmental performance of of major aircraft gets better over time, and there are substantial improvements. Just in the, in the most recent, compared to the next generation of aircraft that we have coming online so that that is a, a problem that you know the entire aviation engineering community is working on with with great gusto to achieve net zero targets for example so we we, we can expect with it without you know being able to predict fully what the details are we can expect that the environmental impact both noise and greenhouse gases will continue to decline as new and better technologies are uh, developed for for aircraft I'll just point out that the latest, some of the latest aircraft can't even dump fuel. So, I mean, that, that there's been a lot of movement in that space. Terrific, David. I might stay with you. Um, how can Western Sydney International operate for 24 hours when the international airports around the world have introduced curfews to protect the health and well-being of their residents? And Chapel Airport is going to introduce curfews next year. Yeah, look, I... I it's, it's not within my remit to, to comment on, on what international airports might do. That's outside my, my zone of experience and, and discretion. Um, I, I would just, just reiterate the government's policy commitment, which has been longstanding and bipartisan, that, that this airport is, is designed as a curfew-free 24-hour airport and, and has been um, situated that way in terms of its original biz case, business case and the environmental assessment since um, as, as being the case. So... Um, I think the only thing I can do to questions like that is simply um, let people know what the government policy is, as expressed by Parliament, um, and you know, um, people are very welcome to to, to contest that through either our, our uh, EIS process through submissions or, or directly to your elected member. Thanks, David. Um, Damien, I might start with you, and then David, you might want to add to this. Um, if there's a high visual impact, have you considered the potential impact on the World Heritage Listing? E.g. Dresden lost its World Heritage Listing due to the addition of a bridge that was not necessarily near the oldest part of the city. I didn't uh, know yes. that. Yes, we are. Oh, so... Damien, sorry, you're on. That's not my fault, that one. <laughs> Someone else told me that unmute me. Uh, yes, so the the Greater Blue Mountains, so matters of national environmental significance and Greater Blue Mountains uh, was assessed separately. So it's chapter 23 in the EIS, EIS and there's a technical paper for it. Uh, and it, it draws uh, a whole bunch of uh, from the other reports. So the visual impacts and the potential for them to affect the listing or the values of the um, the values that give it its, its World Heritage listing um, are assessed and were, even though there was the, the high moderate, which I spoke about from um, Echo Point, um, it wasn't. It's not enough to to threaten that listing, I guess. Uh, but it has been assessed. We we understand it's one of the. I guess it's an emotive thing. It's one of the key um, impacts potentially of the project. Um, but it still wasn't enough to to really threaten that World Heritage listing. Great. Thanks so much for that, Damien. Damien, I'm going to stay with you. This is an interesting question. We get lots of questions about fog, actually, and the operations um, in fog. But this is a little bit different. What um impact does fog have in increasing the number of suspended particles? Fog is a major problem in this area and there's no sea breeze to move fog along. So has fog been um, considered in terms of the increased number of suspended particles? Uh, that's, a really good... that's a really good question. Um, I can't answer off the top of my head. I'd have to, I could get back to you on that. So yes, look, fog, for Western Sydney, I know was um, was considered how it actually relates to suspending other particulate matter. Matter, I'd have to dig deep into that technical paper. Um, but if there's someone, if we've got their their details, Deb, I can get back to you on that one. I, I just don't know that. That's very in depth. Yeah, sure. Question. We'll take that one on notice then, and we'll try and um, then um, reach out um, after the session to the person that made that yeah, question. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. There was always going to be a couple that I think that might stop oh, yes. people in terms of it, um, the questions that we get. Um, 
David, I'm going to give you this question. Part of the value of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area is the serenity combined with the spectacular views. The charter with UNESCO that was signed by John Howard as the PM at the time states Australia will be committed to protecting this area from the impacts and specifically mentions the airport proposal as being dropped. How can you justify imposing noise over this naturally quiet area when noise impacts animals as well as residents? Yeah, look, um, I just want to be upfront and say, you know, at, at no point on this journey have, have we, I think, said to to anyone that there's no impacts from Western Sydney's flight path. So of course there is. Of course there is. Uh, and, and for some, close to the airport, that impact is severe. So I just want to be upfront uh, about that. Um, we have done an assessment of Western Sydney's proposed flight pass on the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area. That assessment has come back um, as, as low um, and the assessment has formed the view that the, the, the attributes and values of the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area are, are, not, um, are not diminished by Western Sydney Airport's um, flight pass, which is, not, which is not to say that there's no impact. You know, of course there is. You, you might see aircraft at, at Echo Point. We know that. Um, there will be noise over some parts of, of the Blue Mountains. Um, we, we know that too. I think our priority is more towards human impacts as opposed to animal impacts. So I want to be upfront uh, about that. Um, but but those, those impacts when taken over the, the entirety of the environmental impact on the Blue Mountains are not, in, in the independent assessor's view, um, sufficient to, to um, threaten the listing of the Great Mountains Heritage Area. Um, so I think that's all we can really say on that. I, I can't speak to the, the Charter or any statement that the former Prime Minister may have said. Terrific. Thanks, David. Um, David, I'm going to stay with you. Another question here. Um, and Damien, you might want to add, I'm not sure. Um, does aircraft taking off make significantly, sorry, does an aircraft taking off make significantly more noise at, say, 2,000, 4,000 and 6,000 feet than, an, than the same aircraft arriving at those three levels? So the question is, is it, I think to summarise, does a plane taking off make more noise than a plane arriving? I might have a crack at that. Yeah, go on. Um, I, I hate to give it an it depends answer, but it does slightly. Um, but I'll, I'll caveat that. So, yes, um, aircraft taking off uh, much higher thrust levels. Uh, thrust equates to noise. Uh, and um, the overall noise from the aircraft is, is higher. Um, but in context, it's the noise that is received by the person on the ground that matters, not the noise emitted by the aircraft. So if the aircraft is at 2,000 feet, they're much closer to the person on the ground. And so the person on the ground will notice um, much more noise. But because aircraft are climbing and they're climbing very fast, by the time you get out to, say, 6,000 feet and quite a few kilometres um, down of track miles down range, someone might um, have noticed less noise because the aircraft is higher, even though it's emitting more noise, uh, than, say, an arriving aircraft, which descends more gradually. Um, so it really does depend how close you are to the airport and what the climb rate of the aircraft is. But in, in very general terms, the closer you are to the airport, uh, yes, a departing aircraft will make more noise. The further away from the air you are from the airport, you run the risk of, in fact, the arriving aircraft creating more noise because it's at a lower level. Hopefully that makes sense. I apologise if it doesn't. Thanks, David. I think you tried very well to explain it. It's all very complex and I think, um, yeah, the attempt that both you and Damien are going to to try and make it as simple as possible is really appreciated as well. David, another question for you. Um, question around, um, if I could summarise, is around the number of planes that are flying over Penrith and Glenmore Park, both during the... Um, 05 day and the 23 day and then the R the reciprocal runway operations at night. It looks like there's a lot of aircraft being concentrated over this area. Is there a particular sort of justification or rationale around that? Um, I noted I noted that comment. Look, um, so first thing to note is that not all runway modes uh, operate at once. So the, only ever one runway mode is operating at one time. Um, so that they're not all there at the same time. Um, I, I think the, the impact and the flight path situation around Penrith depends on a couple of things. One is it, it's simple geography um, and physics. Um, the, the flight path designers are absolutely 
blind as to electorate. I said, wouldn't know who, who the local member is. It's, it's fine, I'm a public servant. It's my job to know those things. Um, uh, but but it is it is literally safety, geography and physics. Um, and, and where that wriggle room is there, then we try and avoid communities. And it really is as, as simple uh, as, as that. I think the other point I would note is that the flight paths were designed under a Liberal government, not under the Labor government. So they actually referred under the previous government not this one. So I don't think you can infer any sort of political outcome from, from the way in which the flight paths were designed. Thanks, David. Um, and Damien, I'm going to go to a question for you. Given the sensitivity, sensitivity of the World Heritage Listing area, particularly over Echo Point, question here is around sort of how has the assessment been independently reviewed and considered in line with other sort of decisions as well? So what's the, I guess, the credibility around the assessment that's happened? Um, so uh, I guess that goes to the very nature of impact assessment. So um, look, I, I work for a company and, and most of the people that develop the CIS work for an independent um, consultancy. We, we were hired by the department. Uh, and that, I guess, independent nature of that assessment is, is key to what we do. We then obviously subcontract to a range of other specialists. And I mean, this is, this is their, their job, their business. Um, they're, they're not biased. They're, they're not pressured into doing anything. So the assessments are done based on um, the latest information, the best knowledge of these, these people, these experts in their field. Um, and, and they are always considered to be an independent assessment of the impacts. Uh, they get reviewed internally. Um, some assessments get reviewed, uh, peer reviewed, but um, that's what this process now is about. I guess everybody is able to review this process uh, during the public display period. Um, changes may or may not be made based on those reviews and, and the validity of those, but um, uh, yeah, no, they, they, everyone that's involved in the, the development of the IS is coming from an independent perspective. I, I hope that answers the, the question. Um, I know there'll be there'll be reviews of this of this um, EIS undertaken by other professional bodies as well, uh, and they'll be providing comment. Terrific. Thanks, Damien. Um, David, another question for you. Um, somebody's asking about the percentage of expected flights in the day versus the night. So sort of I guess, total number of aircraft movements that you might expect in and out of Western Sydney in the daytime versus the nighttime. And I know that will change yes. depending on which year you go to. <laughs> well, honestly, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. It's much more during the day than the night because that's when most people prefer to travel. Um, you know, clearly, clearly some, some aircraft heading to... Uh, North American, European, or maybe even North Asian destinations will, will find there are time zone advantages to leaving in the middle of the night, and there may also be some late passenger aircraft at, at night, but predominantly most aircraft are during the day with, with real busy peaks, um, you know, around a sort of end of working day, so, you know, 5, 6, 7 sort of p.m., um, and start of day to, to cater for business traffic. So, but, but in terms of in the middle of the night, I, I don't know the answer, but, but it is much less. Thanks very much, David. What I'm going to do now is um, move us on to talk around the draft noise insulation and property acquisition policy. If we go back to the presentation deck, thank you. And David, um, I'm going to head back to you for a bit of an overview about the draft policy, kind of how it's been developed and I guess opportunities people have to comment on it as well. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. So um, one, one of the regulatory obligations of, upon the department is that uh, when we do uh, develop the flight pass, we also develop a policy for uh, treating, noise treating uh, houses and or potentially acquiring them and to release that with the policy. So uh, what you have on the screen, there is a very high level overview of what that policy is. And this is something we are seeking community feedback for. Uh, essentially what that blue line means is that if if you're the owner of a building within or on that blue line, then you're a prima facie uh, eligible for, um, under a draft policy, uh, for uh, a noise treatment or at least a noise assessment. I mean, somebody with a, a brand new house that already has triple glazing, there's probably not much we can do to lower, lower any noise impacts, but um, you, you're eligible for that assessment and to be considered uh, for 
uh, the program. So that's for, for noise uh, treatment. Um, the acquisition part of it, um, you'll see a very tight blue line around the runway there. And um, that, that is actually the acquisition contour. And it's based on the acquisition contour that was developed for Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport and for Adelaide Airport. So th this policy is based on the two domestic precedent programs with, with, some, with some differences. And there actually are no properties in, as, as, as probably indicated on the graph, within that blue counter. So, so what the draft policy says is that where, where a, a building can't uh, be insulated, it's just too old or, or we just can't get the, the internal uh, noise down to a, a level that makes it sort of worthwhile from a, a value for money point of view, then with a number of other considerations, including a very willing seller and an ability to, to reach um, uh, to reach fair value on both sides and, and where the, um, uh, the property is very significantly impacted, then, then the draft policy essentially says we'll consider acquiring it. Um, so we can't be any more definitive from that because there are so many variables. Um, every, every owner is different and has different things that they want and, and, and you know, the, some of these properties are exceptionally valuable uh, as well. So we have to uh, have an eye on the, on the public purse as, as part of that calculation. Um, but the, but that, that is why there is sort of less focus on property acquisition here because there actually are no properties automatically identified for acquisition uh, in this program. And, and a lot more value um, emphasis on uh, insulating properties uh, within that blue line. Now, a couple of things to note. So um, that blue line represents what we call the ANEC 20. So we've set that contour uh, at the middle of our noise assessment scenarios so for 2040 uh, and 15 million annual passengers going through. We thought that 2033 was, was too soon. The, the airport wouldn't reach maturity by 2033. And so to attempt to assess properties for noise treatment at 2033, I think was probably putting the, the bulk of the noise impact still to come. Um, by the same token, 2055 was, was simply too, too far out to, to accurately for, do any forecasting. Uh, we don't know what the airport traffic will, will be necessarily. We've got a schedule in there. We're, we've had a, a good consultation um, and scenario in the noise tool, so that is there. But but also there's an awful lot of changes to engineering technology and so on. So we've set the program at 2040. Um, the contour itself is based on the ANEC contour of all of the three operational scenarios superimposed on each other to give the broadest possible eligibility for uh, properties and buildings uh, in that local area. So um, I think that, and, and Setting at ANEC 20 is substantially lower threshold than what Kingsford Smith was, which was ANEC 30. So that's a really tight contour around Sydney Kingsford Smith uh, and indeed Adelaide Airport, which are the two precedent programs. Um, so um, a couple of things to, to note in terms of, of guidance. Um, one is the, the government was took into account that this is 24-hour coffee-free airport. So we do hear loud and clear that, that some sectors of the community are unhappy with that. And so we have factored that into this noise insulation and property acquisition program. Two, we've um, looked at the ambient noise monitoring in the area, which, which is um, reasonably low. So the, the, you're not talking about a really dense inner city area that already has substantial truck and train movements and substantial over head noise. There is lower noise out in Western Sydney. It's semi-rural in nature in parts. Um, so that's been taken into account. And the other thing that's been taken into account is the greenfields nature of the airport. So it's not, it's not as if an airport has always been there since the early 1900s. This is new um, and many of the um, residents in the area uh, predate the airport, obviously. So um, those three things have, have combined to, to justify the need for a lower noise threshold for eligibility for the program. Um, I do want to note it is a draft program, um, so we won't finalise it until next year and we'll base that on community feedback. So we are getting a lot of submissions on this program already, so please keep those coming. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look to finalise the program uh, next year once we go through uh, Cabinet. So and, and the Commonwealth Government's normal approval processes. So there's a bit of work to be done on our side and a little bit of work to be done on the community side in making sure they provide us with their views uh, on, on the program and where they see it. 
Uh, one last uh, point is that the light blue contour is a computer generated contour. It doesn't take account of any pragmatic or practical considerations. It, it goes through streets, halfway through properties. It doesn't take into account the, um, you know, where a natural parkland might be, for example. So we've been very upfront in saying that while these are computer generated contours, um, pragmatically speaking, when we look to finalise the policy next year, we, we will try and follow natural boundaries where we can and where that makes sense to do so. We don't anticipate that the contour will increase substantially. Um, but, we're, you know, where, where the contour goes halfway through a house or halfway through a property where you've got the building on one side but the rest of the property on the other, we'll have a look at, at, at sensibly adjusting it to, to make sure that it doesn't lead to arbitrary outcomes that disadvantage people who, for all intents and purposes, are subject to the same noise impacts but might fall on the wrong side of the, of the computer-generated line. Um, we're aiming for 50 decibels internal inside properties that, that's sort of library quiet. Um, uh, but whether we can achieve that depends fundamentally on the nature of the property, some, some properties. And buildings are very easily treated. Others, particularly older ones, built to different codes and standards, uh, will be much harder to treat. So it's why we, we don't give categorical um, uh, guarantees at this point of the process. We, we simply don't know until we get a noise engineer or a noise assessor into each property to see what is possible. Now, hopefully the community do, do understand that fundamental limitation uh, of the process. So that's the noise insulation and property acquisition program. Happy to take any questions on it. Thanks, David. And um, I note that the team has been answering a couple of questions that have come in um, through the Q&A as well. Um, David, just before I go to the noise insulation um, draft noise insulation and property acquisition policy. Just wanted to go back just to one question, just around flight altitudes over the Blue Mountains area. So this is a question we get um, quite a bit in um, engagement that we do with people. So the levels, the, the 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 altitude that's quoted over the Blue Mountains area is that above sea level, or is it above the altitude of the Blue Mountains that it is quoted for? Yeah, it, it's a good question, and. Um... So the, the altitudes I've quoted are above runway level, which is 260 feet above sea level. Um, the noise contours that are on the noise tool um, take into account terrain levels. So Blue Mountains, we understand, is at an elevated terrain, and that's been fed into the model. So all the no noise contours you see reflect ground terrain uh, over a particular point. Um, but the altitude levels you see on the flight paths in the noise tool show above sea level. We, we are working hard to try and fix that, uh, by the way. We just haven't quite landed a solution uh, just yet. So we, we, we do want to be upfront about that. Terrific. Thank you. Um, somebody's saying here that noise from current flight paths from Kingsford Smith Airport, um, they echo in the valleys and they bounce from the walls. And this actually lengthens the time for the noise to dissipate. Has that echoing factor been um, considered in any of the modelling at all, either for the, the the noise insulation policy or more broadly in the assessment? Yeah, um, this, this is getting probably towards where we'd want a, an expert modeller to, to start answering questions. But I, I will say that certainly the, the AEDT model takes into account um, terrain height. And, and so you, you'll see on some of our contours what we call sound islands, so where, where a contour stops and, but then starts again a little bit further on, and that, that reflects the topography, potentially a raised bit of terrain uh, that brings a, a listener closer to the source of, of the noise. Um, and as part of that, obviously, also reflects valleys and depressed areas of terrain as well. What I am not sure whether it reflects is, is the reverberation type effect that you do get and we understand is there from um, noise bouncing around valley walls and floors. Um, I'm, I'm happy to tell you back to the experts and, and see if we can get an answer for you on that. Right. Terrific. Thanks, David. Another question here, is there any reason why the flights, the real flights, were not used to determine the real noise impact? So uh, the, the person I think is talking here around flights from uh, Sydney, Kings at Smith Airport. So what what if the new of the existing flights were used to help in the noise modeling for, for Western Sydney International? So the 
A, I mean, but bear in mind, Western Sydney is not yet built, not yet operating, so we don't have a we don't have a baseline of aircraft to use. What what the team have done though is calibrated the noise profiles from aircraft heard in Australian conditions and fed that into the model. So I think we've modelled somewhere in the region of twelve different aircraft types. Uh, and that is based on noise profiles actually observed here in Australia. So it's not, you know, it's not just some sort of, you know, uh, un untested theoretical um, noise footprint for these aircraft. The, the model was actually calibrated with actual noise um, uh, footprints from, from aircraft here in Australia. So I, th I think that's probably the closest the team could have done um, where you have an airport that is only half built and not yet operating. So a couple of comments have come in then since while you've been explaining that, David, why don't you just use existing flight, like use planes to fly the flight path so you can hear the noise in, in, in real life, I guess. I'm not sure what the question is getting at. As, as I've said, the, 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 the ADT model, which is a very complex mm. model, takes into account fuel load, you name it, how heavy the aircraft is, where it's going, the terrain underneath it does is based on real world noise emissions from aircraft so i think it has been calibrated to do that but we have to model our flight pass on kingston smith's flight pass so you, you can't really compare an aircraft from kingston smith traveling to dubai um fully loaded a380 you know 350 passengers on board with um an aircraft that might be flying out of western sydney to you know brisbane so it's, it's really not quite that simple. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. This is a good question. Um, with so many airports in the crowded um, Sydney basin, wouldn't it just be more effective to redesign all of the flight paths um, within the Sydney basin? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that is um, one of the most vexed questions when it comes to airspace in, in Sydney. Um, I think everybody understands that at some point, you know, um, we will probably have to do that. You know, it's ultimately a decision of government as to when they want to do that. Um, I would say that just pragmatically speaking, the, the flight path arrangements for Kingsford Smith took some time to work out with the community. The, 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 these are very sensitive issues um, and to sort of, uh, review all of the Sydney Basin, including Kingston Smith, as well as Bankstown Camden, um, is, is a is an exercise that probably takes us beyond the, the time frame of the opening of, of Western Sydney Airport, realistically speaking, uh, and and um, certainly beyond the scope of, of what we've been asked to do here in, here in the department. But but you know we we, we understand the logic of, of the question. Um, you know, when that may happen is potentially when the second runway for Western Sydney is is on the table, and that's that's a couple of decades away because our flight pass won't work with the second runway at Western Sydney. So there'll have to be some deeper thinking done uh, then about how that all works. Terrific. Thanks, David. Um, David, I might get you now to, sorry, it's um, not much break for you. You might want to grab a sip of right. water while I introduce this next section. What we might do is just take a look at um, what community engagement has been um, undertaken to date and with the opportunities for engagement in the future and really importantly how people can make a submission as well. But um, firstly, we'll take a look at um, the information that's available for the community and all of this is on the, the website, the um, www.wisiflightpaths.gov.au website that we're taking you through now. Thanks, David. Yeah, thanks, Deb. So, look, we're fully conscious that the EIS is a relatively inaccessible document. We, we, I guess, according to the EPBC action, the rules have to write it the way we do, so that we cover off on all the things that the Environment Minister wants us to cover off, and and it is very technical and complex for that that reason. But but for you know um, people who who don't necessarily want to read all four thousand three hundred and twenty two pages, that's one of our community members um, added them up and told us how many there was. Um, we have developed the digital EIS as an interactive guide to guide you through. We think at a layer of information that most people would find useful, but without you know, providing mind boggling details. So, so what um, this product does, and you can access it from wsrflightpass.gov.au, is give you what is effectively an EIS summary document, but then links you through 
to the chapter for a more in-depth read and then to relevant technical appendices for an even more in-depth read. So um, uh, maybe also free, just go to aircraft noise is a good one to, to start with. Um, so you can see there um, summary information if you scroll down. Uh, an example of the aircraft noise um, tool. And then those blue bars across the bottom um, give you the links to the technical papers and, and relevant chapters for those who really want to deep dive into it. And the EIS is, is summarised um, there as well. Um, so, so that, you know, I really encourage people if they do want to read the EIS to, to, to start here. Um, there's also a series of helpful videos embedded into this document that explain the EIS process, um, the complexity of the Sydney Basin and so on, and you'll see those in the tabs on the left. Um, for, for those who are really um, looking to get into it, um, we have paper copies. So there's two at the State Library of New South Wales. Um, all, all of the key affected local government areas are there and they're listed on, on the website. So uh, Blue Mountains, I think, has three copies. Penrith has at least two, if not one or two more, um, you know, Fairfield and so on. So uh, most, certainly most Western Sydney LGAs have agreed to uh, put the full eight volume EIS in their local libraries for community members to come in and look at. Um, and as we move into um, the eastern parts of the Sydney with changes to Kingsford Smith, we expect more of them to be on display also at local government areas on that, that side of the city uh, as well. So uh, that they are there for those who, who want to look at it, but, but for I think the vast majority of us um, who, who don't want to go to that kind of detail, the digital EIS really is the, the place to go. Um, I should just point out too, and it's not, it's not on this slide, but it's um, there are a range of really, really good brochures. So if you really want to find out about Western City's flight past the changes to Kingsford Smith, um, uh, the noise uh, impacts and how they were modelled, just go straight to the brochures. I, I find personally that they're probably the best read uh, for most people. Um, uh, Western Sydney is obviously diverse. We, we have uh, translated all of that into five different languages, so Arabic, Chinese, Tagalog, uh, Hindi and Vietnamese. Um, if you come along to our in-person sessions, we can have translators on standby to using the um, TIS service uh, that... Um, that um, DHA offers, so the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, and we're working on getting the three videos, by the way, that are in the um, digital EIS dubbed also into those languages, but that, that's probably about a week away at this point. All right, um, but look, um, wsiflightpass.gov.au, it, it takes you everywhere you need to go. Um, and uh, there are plenty of avenues for people who are either don't want to or just less comfortable with digital interactive um, stuff to, to go see the physical copies. Come along to the in-person uh, community information and feedback sessions and we have paper copies of the EIS summary and all the brochures on hand to, to hand out. And if you just want to do no more than come and get those brochures, you, you're most welcome to. Your, if you want to sit down with, with me or any member of my team, um, we're very happy to do that as well. And... Um, on the next slide is the list of upcoming community engagements. So the ones on the left, community information and feedback sessions, um, we've already done four, so they're the ones in grey. Um, upcoming uh, from tomorrow uh, through to the 9th of December. There may be more scheduled as well. We constantly get requests. Come in and see us. Um, we ask that you register, but it's not essential. It just helps us with uh, numbers and making sure we've got people on hand to, to help people as they come in, but absolutely not essential, and walk-ins are more than welcome. Like I say, come in, um, we'll give you all the physical um, material that you need, and if you have time, we'll sit down with you and take you through the flight pass as they affect your particular circumstances. Uh, on the right is the information stores. So they're, they're more like the, the pop-up stores that you might see in a, a supermarket or, or near a train station. They're, they're designed to give um, uh, basic levels of, of information and direct you into the community information and feedback sessions if, if you can make those. So they're, they're, they're a slightly different model, very much designed to promote uh, and get the word out. Um, the in-depth um, feedback um, is, is in those ones on the left, so the community information and feedback. Sessions, look, um, love or hate the flight paths. Um, the one bit of feedback we do get is that people find those community information sessions really valuable, even if sometimes we have to deliver, you know, distressing news to people because they are very close or very impacted uh, by the flight path. So please consider that if that's something um, you want to get some more information on. Uh, 
And just another plug to um, please consider putting in a submission. Um, if you come along and talk to us at the information stores or the feedback sessions, you won't be sold the airport. Um, we, we have really one job, which is to give you information on the impacts on you from the flight paths. So um, you, you won't get a salesperson um, um, telling you how good the airport is. You, you'll just get very honest, authentic information. Uh, we hope it's taken that way. Um, and we'll sit down with you and, and take it through. So if that helps you then write a submission to government to be part of that process, please do. Um, we, we're really keen to get as many submissions as we can and that A, helps us shape the final EIS and B, it also helps us to demonstrate that we've communicated effectively, effectively with the community as we go through this process, which ultimately is what, what we want uh, as part of an EIS process. Uh, any questions at all, there's one 800 number. It, it does go through to call centre uh, initially, but can be elevated to one of the team if, if there's something that they just can't answer. Uh, that QR code is also exceptionally useful for directing you to our resources. So um, please um, uh, take a shot of that if that suits. All right. I don't know if there's much more I can say. <laughs> David, you've done very well. Thank you very much. Um, and possibly just to add, I think the team's been trying to, I guess, get the word out very much so um, across Western Sydney, Blue Mountains and broader Sydney too. We've um, done a number of different, um, or 21 different train stations, I think, across West, across Sydney and, and handed out around 4,500 postcards to people to try and direct them. So we've, we've tried a lot of different methods, I think, through this um, engagement to try and get people's attention around the, the project itself and, and obviously um, importantly want to make sure that people have had an opportunity to provide submissions in the process as well. Um, so the team behind the scenes, um, John, and Anna have been busily answering all of the questions that sort of came in the period, David, while you were talking about the um, engagement overview there and, and um, what to expect coming up as well. So um, there aren't any other questions that have come through um, in the chat. Um, but I guess just wanted to encourage people again. Um, Oscar, we might just get up the slide again, sorry, with the... Um, with the community information feedback sessions and the stall. So if something's really sparked your interest and you want to come along and have a chat to the members of the team, um, if you'd like to come along to one of our upcoming sessions, um, these are the ones that are coming up. As David's mentioned, they are available on the website as well. So all of the details are available there. Um, um, also, too, the details of the hard copies, if you would like to read a hard copy of the draft EIS, are available on the, on the website, as David's already um, spoken about as well. Um, so there haven't been any additional questions that have come in um, that the team hasn't been able to answer in written form on the, on the screen. But I just wanted to say um, a big thank you to the team um, to you, especially David, for asking, well, presenting so much and answering so many different difficult questions. Also to you, Damien, thank you for the presentation that you gave and answering those tricky questions as well. Um, and if we go to the last slide in the presentation deck again, just with the contact details, if something does um, uh, jog your memory and you want to um, give us a call um, in the morning, please do so on the dedicated number that that phone line operates between nine and five, Monday to, to Friday, or you can always email us at any time at the WISI flight paths at infrastructure.gov.au. And we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. But a big thank you to everybody that's been um, online tonight. And thank you for the great questions that you've asked the team. It's um, really important that we find a way to uh, address as many of your questions as possible. And we hope that tonight's format has been useful for you. Just a reminder that the that tonight's um, webinar has been recorded and we will be putting that up onto the wisiflightpaths.gov.au website as soon as possible. When that does go up on the website, we will email you um, at the email address that you registered to log into tonight's session as well. So we'll close a few minutes early um, and give everybody a bit of their night back. But thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you again at one of our um, information sessions coming up um, prior to the close of submissions. Um, and just a reminder again of that date is the 31st of January um, next year. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. <laughs>